Okay, folks, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa baraka wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody who's joining us live on this uh, webinar across um, the various uh, platforms, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or via the invite link. Uh, welcome you all. Welcome the old returning Al-Maghrib students, old not in age, even if you are old. I'm old. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but just folks that have been uh, with us before, been with our classes before, been with our seminars before. So a big special welcome to you folks. And then to the wider uh, community, those who are joining uh, for the first time, um, uh, thank you for spending your evening with us, sharing a, a few um, discussion points with one of my oldest and best friends, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, um, and who will join us in a second. Um, this is, of course, all in um support of the fiqh salah divine link the new version the 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 launch uh, online uh, everything that the on-site class was and more um and updated to the level of quality that's required i think in today's uh, uh in today's time uh the what we're used to now is seeing on the internet not necessarily islamic content but just general content has clearly um, uh, led to people having to raise their standards, which is a good thing, alhamdulillah. And the great thing is, is that when you raise um, standards uh, in Islamic content, then you get the best of both worlds. You don't have an excuse then to hate on the content because it's poor quality or fuzzy or rubbish audio or whatever. Utilizing great kind of uh, techniques or, or skills of camera and editing and all the rest of it. And then, of course, the content should speak for itself. But anyway, um, that's enough about that. Let's uh, bring Sheikh Yasser in. Uh, hopefully, the technology. Uh, oh, there we go, Sheikh. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. What's happening, Isa? Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. I can hear you. Bro. Alaikum. Don't have to shout, bro. He's here. Come on, I know we're mates in that, but come on, bro. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. How's it going? I'm, I'm right. So the question is now, who's crazier, me or you? Let's just work that one out. Let's let, let's put our cases forward to the jury of, of, of popular opinion, the courts of popular opinion. Let them let them decide who's the crazier for doing this gig right now. In the last five weeks, I've traveled to, I think, five, six countries um, uh, almost every single weekend. Uh, well, more than a little bit more than five weeks. I was in Malaysia, I was in Qatar, uh, I was in Turkey for the ref refugees. Uh, popped into England quickly for that weekend for that uh, award ceremony and whatnot. And I just came back from Canada, literally arrived home 25 minutes ago. So <laughs> you, win. you win, you win, you win. As always, you win. All right. Never mind. Alhamdulillah. And I'm forgetting what my kids look like. That's how bad it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, although, <laughs> although they haven't made you forget what they've done to your computer and your yes, camera. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's true, true. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. So, um, wait, wait, are you sitting in Manchester now? I've just got back, yeah. Just got back. Okay, today. so you got back from Umrah, mashallah. Yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. The alhamdulillah. Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, Umrah, obviously, loads of uh, our people there, subhanAllah. Um, the Westerners, I mean, it's so packed. And the craziest thing, the craziest thing is that, uh, that made me reflect on uh, on the numbers, is that you would not imagine, well, you, 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 you would, obviously, you understand the game, but the prices are so expensive of everything. It's mm. so expensive right now. And it's more busy than before COVID. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. I mean, wow. it's, it's insane. It's insane. I mean, obviously, a lot of the kind of folks from the developing countries, Muslim countries, Eastern countries, they are taking up more of the more surrounding areas. But like, mm. you can't find a hotel for love or money in the localities. It's just so busy. Mm. But Alhamdulillah, it's good. It's good. It's good that people have decided to put their money to right use as opposed to you know wasting it somewhere else. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Someone's having a laugh somewhere. Someone's having, you know, they're playing us, man, with these hotel prices and these ticket prices, man. It's a madness, man. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Alhamdulillah. I mean, there's positives and there's negatives, right? I mean, um, one thing that I noticed in myself as well when I was doing this so regularly, there were times I was doing four or five Umrah trips a year. And I'll be honest with you, um, there's a bit of a routine that develops, right? Like the haiba, the the overwhelmingness that you should feel. I'll be honest, I mean, it's human nature. Sometimes it becomes a little bit of a habit. And, you know, there used to be times, you know, back in the day when I would 
you know, I remember like the first time I was deprived for Umrah for a long period of time, I was, I was college because I grew up in Jeddah. When I went to college, I hadn't been for Umrah for like four years. And I was thirsting, like I was literally yearning, you know. And I remember, you know, seeing the Kaaba after those three, four years. That experience, it still remains with me, even though I've done Hajj and Umrah more times than I can count, you know. So, you know, you kind of, you kind of realize why most of the Salaf, they didn't have this notion of multiple umrahs. You know, it was one umrah per trip. You know the ikhtilaf, you know, amongst the fuqaha in this regard. And that's why it wasn't the ada of our classical ulama. And they would come for umrah maybe twice in their lives, once in their lives even, right? And they would walk four, five, six months. And even then, it wasn't their ada to continuously do from, you know, Tan'im Masjid Aisha to come back, you know? And here we are, we go five, six times a year. And even then, we want to do umrah every single day. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I mean, I, nothing wrong with that. It's my position, and it's not, and it's not even, uh, it's not even, even the Umrah, even just staying in, in Mecca. I was uh, reading yeah. Abu Hanif alayhi rahmatullah, his opinion, makruh to remain in Mecca. Can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, Subhanallah, this is the great th thing about the fuqaha mm -hmm. that you, if you read some of their statements in isolation, you would think, what on earth did he just say? Yeah, right. To say makruh to stay in the holiest place on the planet. Because but they just you don't understand. The heba, you lose the, 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 the respect for it and the possibility of committing sins there, you know? Le there are levels to this game when it comes yeah. to deen yeah. and to be an imam, to make statements like that. And the man, I hate yeah. that. Imagine he was on social media when he wrote that. In his oh, tweet. God. Imagine yeah. the cancellation culture. Imagine the refutation, guys, man. Take that clip. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I mean, let's be honest. Eh? I'm going to be, I, I know all of our friends and listening. Well, let's be honest. Don't you look forward to, I don't know, Smash Burger as well and, you know, uh al bayk and all that stuff i mean it's a part and, and the experience of having fun with the brothers right the experience of chilling and whatnot and there's nothing wrong with us all halal and mubah let's be honest nothing not a sin but doesn't that take away from the ultimate maqsad right so yeah i'm just pointing out the awkward realities that you know this world that we live in this 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 world roller coaster whirlwind of a ride where Subhanallah, nobody could have imagined that somebody from America or England is going to be going five, six times a year, you know, as if it's like a walk in the park, you know. And Alhamdulillah, that has a lot of benefits. But let's also recognize there are certain costs that come with it as well, you know. You know, my exactly. daddy and dada, may Allah have mercy on them, they only went once in their lives, you know. And the story she would tell me, you know, like the impact that it had on her one time. I don't think all of my combined could have equaled her one in 1971, whatever, you know what I'm saying? On the ship she went, you know, like back in those days, you know? So khair, anyway, I didn't want to side No, no, a big shout out to some of my, I can see some of my uh, my uh, Umrah gang, the Serbia program, alhamdulillah, just finished today. Uh, certainly did the, the, the section that was at Mecca and Medina. And uh, now obviously it continues. I can see a lot of those folks in the, in the uh, comments, uh, especially Suraya. Baji, who's right there, loud and proud. Uh, all right, so, Sheikh, so the uh, plan was to bring up some issues that we've uh, covered in the class as well, you know, about the Fiqh Salah, you know, about Divine Link, uh, the online version. We've done some videos on it, um, uh, but I know that you've been dealing with a few of these issues, um, both individually, uh, a part of the library chats, and the, uh, I think, uh, as part of the Fiqh Councils. Uh, just remind me now, which Fiqh, fiqh Councils are you on now? Isna has one, right? The Fiqh Council of North America, which was founded by ISNA, but now it's independent, FCNA. Right. right. Yeah. Of um, course, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the main, the oldest one in America. That's the one. Amja, um, I'm not an official Udu, but I am I'm a Musharri. Contributing guy. member. Contributing yeah, yeah. member. Yeah, yeah. Amja. So there's, there's a few of the individual things you're doing, and then a few of the, the collective ones here, this side, I'd be part of Al Qalam on that. Uh, but I found that, you know, SubhanAllah was very interesting. Um, and I don't know. I don't know your, your take on this. The Americans, uh, in general, seem to uh, gather the councils together for a novel, and by that I mean modern fatwa for some issues. Where it seems to be in the UK, there's a greater reliance on trying to make a qiyas or find a qawl within a madhab as opposed to making a council kind of ruling on that. Any 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 thought on that? I think it's, it really goes back to the founders of our communities versus your communities, right? Right, right. I mean, our communities, by and large, were founded by the Haraka, the Sahwa movements, you know, of the 60s and 70s. You know, they were coming from, let's be honest, the Sayyid Sabiq type school. Yes. You know, they're coming from that, 
these are the founders of Isna and Ikna, the founders of all of the old school masajid. Generally speaking, most of them are coming from that mindset, you know, mm -hmm. whereas you guys, as you're aware, are coming straight from the maslak madhab, you know, mindset, you know. Yeah. I think that's a very obvious ramification, therefore, that our oldest council is already, it's not wed to the notion of blindly following one particular madhab. They're already wanting to look at fiqh al waqi' you know, they're already looking at, you know, the, the global issues in light of our traditional sources and more than happy to, you know, find a correlation between the two. Whereas, as you're aware, you know, the more madhab minded people, they really want to stick as much as possible to the madhab. And even if they go upon a khuruj, they have to make tafri' al usul, they have to figure out from within their frame how they're going to do that for a very hala istithna'iya, hala daruriya. And khair fi kullin khair, yani rahmat, yani. Even if the hadith is weak, the maxim is yeah, as, very, very as universally, you know, uh, accepted by our fuqaha that this mainstream spectrum of the ummah, alhamdulillah, it gives us that limit of tolerance that we should respect. And even if we disagree, disagree with adab. 100%. 100%. Right. Okay, let's jump in. Then let's take a few of the masail that uh, come to your mind. So I messaged you a little while ago whilst you're in a taxi coming out of the airport. Uh, what do you... What are the ones that hit you straight away? Um, so why don't you, we would go like we did last time when we did the Protect This House uh, webinar. Mm. We'd do one by one, challenge each other with what we think is uh, relevant or what you've heard one of, uh, you know, me say or you say. So yeah, let's go for it. Bismillah. Jay, I mean, there's obviously a lot of issues that are not necessarily modern as much as they are like context modern, i.e. it's not as if Salah has changed in 2023, but we're simply aware of predicaments in a different way than in the past and i think one or two things that come to my mind that when you mentioned you want to talk about you know salah in the modern world um i think uh the two main topics that i think our readers would find very or your viewers would find very beneficial number one uh salah while traveling um the jama and qasr issue and it's and not just overall what is the tahdeed of safar, which I think definitely, yani we cannot be madhabist when it comes to the, you know, the, the, the safar distance. But also, when you're actually traveling in a plane, which is the most common form of long distance travel, and when you are traveling more than five, six hours, which is again the default for, I mean, pretty much every one of us, at least twice a year, you know, or at least once a year, will be taking that long journey somewhere where we're going to cross over multiple time zones and multiple salah timings, right? Uh, if not like four or five salawat sometimes, you know, when I go to Australia once every four or five years, I mean, literally you're praying five prayers, you know, on one way and on the way back, zero prayers because you're passing yeah. over like, you know, crazy. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I think that's one issue. And then maybe later on, another issue would be salah in the uh, northern latitudes, um, which again, um, you know, I was in Alaska a few months ago on a family vacation and I met the brothers and sisters, you know, in uh, in Anchorage and then in Fairbanks, which is like, you know, closest to the North Pole in America, you know. So I went all the way up to Fairbanks as well, went to the Musalla, met the brothers there and, you know, interacted with them and, you know, hearing from them directly how life is like in Ramadan and the actual timings of Taraweeh and Suhoor, you know, how unrealistic it is to follow fatwas that we give from the comfort of our middle latitudes, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, um, I, so I think these are two issues I think that come to my mind if you want to discuss those, you know. So, so before we open that up, I think what was interesting about the two examples that you gave, and by the way, to everybody else, this is not pre-planned, or, or we haven't done any kind of discussion. We just literally minutes ago said, you know, what are the main uh, matters that come to mind? Um, just from the two that you just mentioned there, the, what comes to mind immediately is uh, what you said. There's no new Salah that's happening, right? And then the issues themselves are uh, has, as they always have been, but context changes. But maybe with a few things, you do have completely, utterly unique situations. Like, for example, Jam and Qasr, and even in a plane, you'll be able to, I mean, you're not creating any new rulings per se. You're definitely mm -hmm. making an analogy on what exists. So I think that that's pretty uh, covered. Uh, whereas on the issue of extreme uh, northern climates, latitudes that are very, very high, um, you've got two levels. You've got, first of all, the fact that I would put forward that we don't have anything. I can't remember coming across anything in the books of fiqh about uh, uh, extreme northern latitudes. Very equatorial, uh, equatorial stuff most of the time. If Even if you look in the books of history, even if you look in the books of the travelers, 
and you see what their narrations but they don't seem to be going high they mention a lot about the differences in the misage of the people in weather yeah. but they don't talk about the changes in length of the day have you in your reading come across anything to prove that they went high yeah from the 16th century onwards the ahnaf have a discussion because bulgaria was conquered by the ottomans and northern bulgaria of course bulgaria back then was not our modern bulgaria but that region and so the bulgar uh, you do find discussions um i don't want to mention the book's name but i have come across it i mean um so i mean obviously i'm not saying i read the asl book but i read dissertations about this issue obviously these dissertations are quoting you know um was it ibn abidin or whatever don't quote me on that but basically later ahnaf yes we do find as for the earlier um yeah you're right nothing comes to mind of people having been aware of muslims living in those regions and they probably weren't muslims living in those regions you know for the bulk of islamic history up until you know the 15th 16th century uh ce obviously which is when uh these types of discussions are found the preliminaries but you're right we don't have the type of detailed discussions um and definitely no uh um uh, explicit fatwas about what to do when the sun does not set you know what to do when uh you know for months go by and you either don't see the sun or you don't see the moon um but there are references yes and um we can look them up and i don't i mean you know i, I so, have books written so, on it, yeah. so, so 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 there's two things there as well the, the first is is that absolutely you'd have expected the hanafis to have come to this because that would be le latter expansion exploration under the uthmani empire yes, obviously exactly so that's where you'd expect to see it and that is actually is the first place that you start to see the concept of the signs of Isha have not entered. This was not a discussion in the other schools of Fiqh other than the Hanafi school. And actually, we still have some of the Hanafi fuqaha, even though it's the, the more non-madhab, the more Shafi'i, the more Arab type scholars that have given the fatwa of combining and perpetual twilight and the like. It's actually the Hanafi school that set them up for their for their fatwa by suggesting that Isha doesn't enter because of the signs of Isha, because of the disappearing mm -hmm. of the white light and red light by the way i know that everybody that's online must be thinking hold on what's going on the conversation is maybe uh, deep or phrases i want to remind everybody that all of this content every single thing that you just heard right now has been uh, covered in the class um and not just in terms of content not just in terms of demos actually even the movement of the sun and recording via time lapse and my commentary over it as well, by the way, we did the uh, Sheikh Yasser, we did the uh, uh, Calgary. Now, you know, Alberta is northern, hardcore. Yeah. So we did that in the summer as well to show mm. the concept of perpetual twilight and uh, the difference mm. the difference between normal times of the year and the like. So don't worry about uh, uh, the fact that you might be getting a little bit lost or whatever. And we have the live sessions as well in uh, the class that will answer questions that maybe you folks are putting uh, here as well but yeah the point i was going to end with uh, Sheikh, is that the uh um uh, the difference between not having a a, a previous discussion amongst the fuqaha uh, versus a discussion of the fuqaha today but as you said from the comfort of their own homes and not actually mm. in the field itself which is almost as big a difference as not even having discussions back then so that there are levels there's almost three levels let's look for it back in the salaf can't find anything let's give fatwa today make the fatwa then you get out then you realize you're mm. hopelessly off the off the off the mark right yeah, yeah so, so what would you say you changed what would you let's let's kick off with northern climates what would you say that you ruled with absolute confidence and me and you have discussed this before over the last few years you know this has been a hot mm. topic because obviously northern europe we're in that that part yeah and you know you know one of our mutual friends and scholars and teachers Sheikh Abdullah yeah. gave the fatwa of of combining um yeah. tell me what you were upon and what you changed yeah so um initially like i don't know how many years ago when you first study fiqh you form your initial minds and whatnot maybe 15 years ago whatever uh the position i felt is that these people should follow uh the closest um uh, place that is still having five times salawati the proper times were there you know um and that fatwa is i think still very reasonable i'm not against it by the way it's all a gray area pun intended it's all a gray area whichever position you follow there are many ulama and councils that have held it but I traveled first and foremost, the first time I traveled really up north was to Tromso in Norway. This was like seven, eight years ago. I actually have a video still, you know, the northern most the country in the world. When you flew the plane, yeah? yeah the what? When you yeah, yeah the plane. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, you remember, remember that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, and I ate whale meat, whale steak, 
a unique type of whale that's sold in Trump. So, oh, what an amazing meat. But anyway, yeah. So I went to like northern region. And the masjid, Ba'ijma, was following a fatwa that at the time I mocked and ridiculed, right? But the imam and the community. And that fatwa, which I still, I'm not happy with it, but I concede that it exists, you know? That is, they were following Mecca. Okay? They're following Mecca throughout the year. They're Pure just artificial times. Pure artificial reality. Yep, yep, yep. Just look, yep. At, the, just look at the watch and say, exactly. right, get this outside, it's time exactly. to break. Exactly. Right. Then I visited Alaska recently, right? And turns out almost all of the masajid are following the exact same position. And I met a sheikh there, yani, Talib al-Im, sheikh, yani, Azhari or Nadawi, I forgot, but yani, uh, you know, graduate, yani, that, um, um, uh, respected seminary. And he told me the exact same thing, that he was an imam here in Central America, here in my Central meaning, I mean, USA. And, you know, for the longest time, he would have the same fatwa that, you know, they should follow something close by or something. Then he goes, I've been living here six years, you know, with my wife and kids. And I've realized it's impossible to follow the fatwa that, you know, you delay it to like 11 p.m., you know, which is the, because, the, you know, in Fairbanks, like in Alaska, Maghrib might literally be like 11.50 p.m., literally, like right before midnight, you know. Uh, and then Fajr is going to come in, what, 3.30, you know, something like that. Now, put yourself as a family man, a working man, put yourself as a mother. You need to live a lifestyle where your iftar is at midnight, right? And then you have to pray taraweeh. And then you have to, you know, have suhoor. And then you have to get to work. Actually, it's, you ask yourself, is this what the shara' requires, you know, upon everybody? And I discovered the vast majority of little musallayat and masajid, definitely the largest masjids in Anchorage and in Fairbanks, are not following the fatwas I'm giving here in Dallas, you know? They're going with the Mecca fatwa. So, and this is not as if Tromso and, and Anchorage agree to this, you know what I'm saying? But just by virtue of the fact that they found it so difficult. And then, of course, there's another fatwa which is very interesting, which is actually given by, uh, what is it? The Al-Majma' al, al uh, Markaz al falak al duali which is Tabi' li I mean, it's an official body of the Rabita. And um, they, they have a nice uh, fatwa on this regard, where they say, Look, the fatwa of following the closest land is definitely the ideal, but the sharia... Closest, closest Muslim land, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the sharia takes into account haraj. And they said, if somebody, for a reasonable reason, yani, and they gave very generic, like somebody's working, you know, somebody's going to school. Like these are, everybody does this, right? They can't fast that long. Then another option, which is really interesting, is the 19 hour fatwa now again all of these are there's no like hardcore basis it's not like there's a hadith 19 hours you know but the ulama of this council and their respected ulama um, yeah, well-known names that are that are sitting in the majma al-fiqh and others they said 19 hours is the maximum level of reasonability we can assume that a person is able to fast at least give them six hours you know, to, you know five six hours to you know eat and sleep and drink and whatnot you know so khair, in the end of the day, we find, you know, three or four um, uh, fatawa. Number one, that uh, you make taqdeer and you must pray five prayers at some difference of time, right? And they base this on the hadith of the Dajjal, well known. Number two, which is Yusuf al judais which is, uh, okay, Maghrib at least, make Maghrib at its time. And Maghrib and Isha, uh, you will just combine is one. And that's like as if, you know, halat al or musafir. Number three is that, find the closest Muslim land that still has sunrise and sunset and actual Shafiq al-Ahmar disappearing, and then follow them. And number four is following Mecca. What is unites all four of these is that basically all of them are saying pray five times a day and yes. fast Ramadan. You know what I mean? That's the whole point. Whether you follow one, two, or three, or four, you are praying five times a day and you are fasting the month of Ramadan. And each one of these four you know, different schools, alhamdulillah, there are great ulama that have held them. And you know, you find that they're all trying to make our religion accessible. You know, there's a level of difficulty the Sharia will reward you for. There's a level of difficulty that becomes foolish or too much, you know? And what that line is, is not set in stone. And the taba'ir or the natures of men are different. 
and some people can bear more than others. And the taba'i or natures of fuqaha are different, and some fuqaha are stricter than others. So when you combine all of this, this is where we get the rahmah and the diversity of the ummah. This is where we get, you know, the Abu Bakr and Umar, you know, astaghfirullah, not to compare, but yin and yang. I mean, there's an element of truth here. Right? Yeah, yeah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for somebody like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and for somebody like Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhum jami'an. And that represents really a type of diversity from the very beginning, from the very get-go. Even amongst the Sahaba, you had the more, you know, um, literalist, no exceptions, you know. Ibn Abbas is an example. And then the more Maqsadi, Ibn Mas'ud is an example, you know. No problem, alhamdulillah, fi kullin khair. So I actually gave a long Q&A on my website, on, the, you know, my I have a Q&A with the Epic. And what I said, I went over all of these opinions. Then I said, if you ask me which position to follow, I will say, don't listen to me, oh people living in northern lands. Go listen to your local imam. This was the answer I gave them. Don't listen to me. I don't live amongst you. Go to your local sheikh and alim who lives amongst you, right? Because, you know, not every, like Calgary is not the same as Fairbanks. You cannot compare Calgary yeah. to Fairbanks, you know? Yeah. So rather than give a, you know, a hard and fast fatwa from my humble opinion, no. I said, look, these are all of the majami, majami the councils out there. I went over all of these fatwa. And then I said, if you ask me which one you guys should follow, listen to me carefully. Don't follow me. Don't even come to me for this. Go to your local masjid. And if they have a sheikh who's trained in whatnot, he would be aware of all of this. Whichever fatwa he gives you, fi kullin khair. Alhamdulillah. So a question for you on, on the back of that. Uh, what level, and you know that this kind of approach to fiqh, um, where we're trying to make things easy based upon the fact that fiqh by definition is about making things easy. By literally by definition, um, also we have to have some caution. How, what would you use as your yardstick, your red line, where you can see situation going on? Because otherwise it gets silly, and that's something that yeah. That, the, the Consistency. Yeah. I told the brothers up there that if you're going to follow this fatwa in the summer months, you should follow it in the winter months as well. Nice, nice, nice. I said, don't, 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 you know, <laughs> follow it when it's difficult, you know what I'm saying? And then, mashallah, Fajr in the winter months is going to be what? Like 8, 9 a.m. Fajr? And then Maghrib is going to be like 2, 2, 2 p.m. You know what I'm saying? I said, so don't follow any local timings at that time. That's not fair either then. If you want to follow the fatwa, then you should be consistent. And therefore, you're living here for periods of time. Then I don't see this as, yani. You know, um, but obviously, even this is an opinion, by the way, because other fuqaha would say, no, no, let them take the laxity when the maghrib is easy, you know. But I, I personally, I don't know. If you want to be consistent, you're going to follow Makkah, then follow Makkah. Khalas, fair enough. Follow Makkah and khalas. And you are, you know, um, uh, set in this regard. But khair, I mean, anyway, and, um, there's no there's no easy answer to this. But I would say, ta'rifuhum bisimahum. You know people by their reputations. So look at the track records of the scholars whom you're asking fatwas from. And if you find amongst them consistent laxity in everything, and it's not a healthy sign. And if yes. you find amongst them, sometimes they give the easy and sometimes they give the hard fatwa, this is a very good sign. And if you find they always give the stricter fatwa, that's also not a good sign. So I would say, ta'rifuhum bisimahum. Ahsant. All right. Okay. Go. What, what's the uh, your thoughts on the uh, prayer in a plane? You've seen the video that I did. Um, that wasn't covering obviously the fiqh of when to pray uh, concerning the time zone change. It was a very straightforward journey uh, where the evening came in, maghrib came in, salah was easy to be able to work out, mm. etc. And the issues that 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 come forward in the modern time is when a day comes and you don't pray at all, or you've gone the other way around by the Pacific and you've skipped the day, right? Mm. Because the prayers in the day gone. That, so, I don't see a problem with that because you'll make it up one way, and you make it. This is an arbitrary time change. You look going, at what, the, what if I'm going one way journey, bro? <laughs> then khalas, then your one way is over there as well. No problem, inshallah. Khalas, okay. And I don't see a problem with this. You're crossing over of the date line means nothing. You look yep. at the you look at the the you know your 24 hours is what you need to look at, and your sunset and sunrise. That's what you need to look at. So um I think from Australia on the way back, you might leave after Fajr, if I'm not mistaken, and you'll arrive in America, yani basically before Asr, yani before Dhuhr, right? So Local you times, local this. times. So local Fajr, you leave in Australia. Local time, Asr, you And the whole way is the sun. 
That's the and point. The whole way is the sun. That's yeah. the, I mean, it doesn't matter the local times. It's the mattering what your journey is, right? Where you yeah. are. On the way, other way, subhanAllah, you'll be praying five prayers. Yeah. You know, because you'll yeah. see the entire sunrise sunset while you're on the plane. So yeah. the way that I, I mean, this is, of course, I mean, this is the vast majority opinion. I mean, you look at where you are. You don't look at any where you, you look at the, the sunrise and sunset where you are, even if it's on the plane. You just look outside and you can make a judgment call, right? So Fajr yes. for you comes when you see the sunset, not when yeah. the sun sets 30,000 feet under. You know, it's where you see the sunset. And the main issue obviously comes about kayfiyat the salah on the plane. Yes. Um, the, again, there's a whole spectrum of opinions. Um, uh, I know, uh, let's not mention names, but yani, one of the senior scholars of the uh, Azhari uh, yani, school, uh, he has a fatwa, a very famous fatwa, where he literally said, you don't pray on the plane, nihaiyan, you know, and this is a fatwa that many of his followers follow, and he goes, you make it up qada and when you land, okay, because he has some, I don't want to say harsh adjectives, but you're not muttasil ala al basically. Yeah, he's not considering a solid a solid ground. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so it's like, khalas, you don't pray. Uh, okay, it's an opinion, what can I say? It's an opinion, I just, I don't find that to be something that I am, attracted to well, it. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull you on this, right? So again, you gotta understand now we have obviously a lot of folks online here and those that will be taking a class of their different levels. There has to be some clarity for them, right? Especially from us, those who lead them and, and teach them and answer their questions, where we're kind of calling a lot in this era, as you know, and rightfully so you put the argument for it very well and you have a, a, a reputation for it. That we need to bring people together more we need people to appreciate difference of opinion more and to calm down um the problem is is that when you create that paradigm amongst the people they certainly do not have the ability then to differentiate between what is a nonsense and if we keep on just saying it's an opinion it's an opinion we're actually undermining the the, the science and the field itself um you just said a few seconds ago that you know it's important to be able to know the right people because they have that range and you're able to see that they've got, you know, they're not blinkered in just one way. So you can trust them. One of the ways that we must have trust is to call out when something is nonsense. Now, obviously, that's a strong word because you can always put an argument. I mean, in all of the madahim, all of the madahim, there's a discussion about height of, of praying yeah. uh, uh, to Imam and whether he can be on the same, whether there's a platform, not platform. Those of the people who are on the second level. So the, the conversation exists. So you can't say that it's baseless. But then it's it, we have to have the guts, I think, to say, well, this is a norm now. That ground is a different type of ground that we're on. And we've got to treat it like that. And there's an almost consensus on that. Why on earth would you change that when it's only going to increase and not decrease? Right? Agreed. So this, this I mean, this voice is relatively solitary. Very, very I don't know of any other reputable alim alive today. Maybe a hundred years ago when they're discussing theoretical fiqh and they wrote these types of things. So he has a quote from somewhere, some some classical book or medieval book. And khair, maybe you know they had some notions back then, but the modern world we live in, you have I don't know 300 million people flying in planes per year. I don't know how many, you know, some some exorbitant number. We have to be pragmatic about we can't just tell them, okay, your salah, you don't have to pray when you're the plane. So I mean, I, I respect the sheikh. I just think this is a fringe opinion. That's all I'm going to say. Now, if an ammi doesn't know any better and he follows the sheikh, he's excused in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're still teaching respect because, you know, the sheikh has studied and he has a mansib that, that allows him to give... And saying that you've got a dodgy opinion doesn't destroy everything. This exactly. Is yeah, you have some dodgy opinions. I know I have quite a few, so it's okay. <laughs> it's, like, it's all fine, bro. Actually, brutally honest, if an alim doesn't have a few dodgy opinions, wallahi, it means he's a really mediocre blaze alim. You know what I'm saying? Let's be honest here. Every single mover and shaker, every single person who was original wanting to benefit the ummah, he has some things that are kind of on the fringe. But you look at the overall, you know, that's the reality of our ummah. And so, yeah, I mean, no problem if somebody has, um, you know, a, a position like this, but that is a fringe. Now let's get to the mainstream ones. Mainstream ones, what you have, for example, many of the senior Ahnaf and the Deobandis in particular, you know, they have a very strict fatwa. I admire it. I have no problems, whoever does it. I just think it's a little bit too strict. And that is, you pray in your seat, but you know that your prayer is batil. And you must repeat your prayer when you get to your uh, destination and you make it all up again. Okay. 
MashaAllah. Okay, yani it's fine. Then of course you have the you know um uh those that are they're they're adamant that they're going to stand up and pray in the exits of the planes, you know. And frankly, I'll be honest, I followed this opinion pre-9-11. I followed it in my 20s. When I was a student in Medina, every time I go, and this was before there was any airline that had a player prayer place, by the way. Western Airlines, Eastern Airlines, you know, those were different times. You remember those times, you know, the, the late 90s and whatnot, you know. I would do this. I never once yeah, any, um, sat down in my place and prayed pre-9-11. But post-9-11, as you know, I think the world changed. And not just that, but it's not just the 9-11. It's actually that there is a legitimate reason why you should not be standing in the exit of the plane. There is a safety factor. There is a sensible reason why you're not supposed to congregate in those areas. So I don't think that it is feasible in planes that don't have a special prayer place that you stand up and face the Qibla and pray. There is no plane except for one airlines that would allow you to do that. The only airlines then that has a prayer place, khalas, then you stand in line back there. When your turn comes, you get inside, you pray, and then no question, that's the default you should be doing. Where there's a prayer space, no question. You should be in that prayer space. But if there's no prayer space, then I think the most reasonable fatwa, and it is a mainstream one, and I believe your video um, explicitly mentioned this, is that uh, as the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, صلي قائما فإن لم تستطع فقائدا فإن لم تستطع فعلى جنب. Right? You try your best. استطاع here is relative. And it is contextual. And I think this is where we get back to the context of fiqh. It's not mm -hmm. as if we're rethinking through fiqh. It's that the context of the haraj of standing up in a moving airplane that's moving at 550 miles an hour, given the current safety issues and the current political climate and the current everything, that context is somewhat unprecedented. So for us to then take into account, this is a genuine haraj for the traveler, for the co-travelers, for the airplane pilot to take into account safety issues, right? For the, you know, um, air hostesses, everything there. It is a genuine haraj. And even, by the way, I remember when I was to do that in the back in the day, I would interfere with the trolleys, you know? I mean, it's a genuine, and back then I was my fanatical. Come on, this is like 23, 24, the Medina days, big beard. Yani, there was no worry of the 9-11 thing, but you're interfering in the service of the airline, you know? It's not like what type of, that's not the religion that really we need to be a little bit more yani, understanding that who are you to block the passageway, you know what I'm saying? And it's not right for a person to do this. So I think it is reasonable for us to take into account the modern haraj of an airplane. I wouldn't say the same in a train that has space, okay? If there's a train that has space, then bismillah, go to a corner and, and pray, no problem. But an airplane is a different, you know, a completely different uh, uh, arena. And for us to understand that, yes, there is a genuine haraj to block the aisle, to block the exit, and there is no space to pray, then I think the most obvious fatwa we should give is you turn your face to the qibla as much as you can for the takbirah, right? You make a judgment call and you can, and remember, by the way, and you're aware of the sheikh, but most of our, our viewers, uh, um, if they've studied with you, they would know, but as you are, most of the awam and muslimin, they complicate qibla far more than it needs to, you know? Qibla is generic. Ma bayn al wal maghribi qibla, you know? Qibla, you face a very generic direction and you're facing the qibla. Actually, it is a fitna to have the iPhone watches with the Qibla on it because it messes up with the minds of the Muslims, right? And they literally think, oh, if I pray this way, my salah is batil because my error points this way, you know? They don't understand the Qibla, al-amru fihi sa'a, from, from the nas of the hadith. You pray in a generic direction. That's it. So if you're traveling north, traveling east, you don't have to have a, you know, a, a Boy Scouts badge of honor to understand, you know, oh, you guys know what a Boy Scouts do. I mean, these these are kids that train in in, in mountaineering and in maps. Right. And, yeah. You don't need to know the details of a map. Just have a very basic idea where the plane is going, right? And just make a generic guess. Okay, the Qibla is to my right or the Qibla is to my left. That's all you need to do. That's literally it. And then you just face in your seat as much as you can. You know, say the takbir. If you're in business class, I agree, stand up, you know. Uh, and all, all the dreamliners, a lot of the newer yeah, plans. yeah. If, uh, if you're yeah, in premium economy as well, you can at least stand up and just in your seat say the Fatiha, you know, and then Rukur, you sit down and say that you go down a little bit more. I think this is a very acceptable fatwa, and I'll be honest, that's what I do. 
I do it all the time when I, now obviously, and here's a disclaimer. I don't know if you're going to agree with this or not. Let's have a little bit of back and forth. If the two prayers, I can pray them combined either before or after, then I will do so. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Yeah. But here's the, the caveat. Even if I haven't begun my travel, I'm at, at home. Yeah, I think there's space for that as well. And as, as you know, yeah. I would rather pray standing and full than pray sitting and shortened in the plane. Yes. It's all about how many concessions are you taking, right? Yeah, so, so it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's an equation. You think, right, yeah. on the plane, I'm going to be taking a concession of not standing. I'm not going to be making sajda. I'm not going exactly. To, whereas if I combine at home, well, that's the only concession I'm taking. Exactly. A concession which is well established for reason anyway. A concession which doesn't require emergency situation. How do you think that bass? Absolutely. And I think that's the point. People have got to, um, what people can't do is just to, allow this difficulty build to build upon the non kind of already feared state don't really feel regular in saline away and just use it as an excuse not to pray exactly that's the, that's the disaster we've got to make sure that we can kind of avoid that there's something you just said that reminded me you know i mean i don't think anybody has any qu any question that you shouldn't be praying in the in the in the in the walkways or the whatever they're called uh, and the emergency exit areas once this is now going back to 90s i was coming back from mauritania right and i'd done a, a, a um a little session there and i got into the plane and the it's air france in those days were the only airline that was flying from new to uh, paris it was the only way that you could get in and uh there were and, and obviously mauritania back then the same as now one of the poorest countries in the world so most of the people on the plane are aid workers right um and so there's a lot of non-muslims on the plane and there was a three <laughs> there was three french folks young kind of whatever at the bulkhead so the bulkhead is you know the uh, uh right at the front where the wall is yeah normal economy class normal kind of thing so I'm sitting a few rows back, just sitting there watching, and I see a Shankiti, a Mauritanian, get up, and he's looking around, you know, and you can see that he's looking at the floor. He's thinking, where can I pray? <laughs> so the emergency exit, is, I don't know, there's a curtain there. He can't see anything, and he's looking at this situation. He's looking at the alleyway, and he kind of works out. I can't pray in the alleyway. There's people going up and down. So he sees these three people sitting at the, 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 <laughs> the bulkhead, and then he stands at the... Uh, like imagine the guy sitting there with his feet, he stands right there in front of him, and they're all three looking at this guy who's standing where their feet is. And the standing is no problem. And even the ruku was weird, but then when he went to sajda, you know, like you cleared the stones yep. away before you make sajda, he pushed their feet away. Oh my god, all of their feet, he went for full sajda and he prayed. He prayed fully. And I remember telling the story in the first version of Divine Link when we, when we taught this uh, on site. That wasn't the killer. The killer was that he prayed his two rakah, and I'm watching him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Astaghfirullah. 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 La Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayl qayyum. He's sitting there for five minutes making a dhikr. Well, these people, they are like they're just I have no clue what to do. <laughs> That's the craziest thing I have oh, ever yeah. seen on a plane. The craziest thing ever on a plane. All right. Um, so uh, so we've done um, uh, northern latitudes. We've done the issue of praying in restricted areas. This obviously covers cars as well. Again, to everybody that's watching, there's a lot of term terminology that's being used. There's a lot of uh, examples that are being used. I promise you every single one of these are covered in detail and with live q and I mean, obviously now we have very limited time just to touch things in the... Uh, in a in a in a in a, in a uh, kind of not so deep way, but uh, you'll have the opportunity to be able to ask about these in the sessions, not just in, as part of the recording sessions when you uh, sign to the class, but also in the live Q and A sessions of which we have uh, many. Um, especially these cover cars is course covered. Uh, every form of uh, transport is covered. All right. Um, there's something that I'm going to release a clip on tomorrow. I don't know whether you must have heard, you get, you've got your ear to the internet. You must have heard about the masjid that's in the center of London that doesn't allow women to pray in there. Uh, masjid yes, in, uh, I've heard a lot about it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we, so in the class, we went to the masjid, okay, okay. with a group of sisters, okay, okay. and uh, basically tried to make, yani, you know, some kind of, uh, tried to 
you know, understand the situation from the girl's side and from their side. And it's actually, honestly, it was one of the most fascinating things we did in the class. And there'll be a small clip we'll share tomorrow. What's your take on male only and female only, sp only spaces, spaces for, for the Salah? I mean, obviously, female only spaces is easier to discuss because there's no shari reason for that. Male only spaces, I understand the psychology of our elders. Because from their perspective, Jumu'ah ah is obligatory on the male, and it's not obligatory on the female, and space is limited, and so they have their reasons. I do understand those reasons. Um, as you're aware, the entire globe is reshifting its understanding of gender roles, and frankly, even gender right now, right? And this is going to be a very contentious discussion, where there's no black and white clear cut answer. How much do we allow the changing of our own mores and traditions in order to prevent a greater change that we don't want, right? How stubbornly should we stick to each and every issue that maybe our ancestors, you know, stuck to? And this is not an easy discussion. It involves um, multiple factors, including culture, including psychology, including masculinity and femininity. Shara is one of the many factors involved. So once again, um, I can't take a clear-cut side here. I can speak in generics. Given the changing circumstances of the globe, I think it is necessary for the majority of masajid to have spaces for men and women. I think that we need to cater to the needs of our sisters in a way that perhaps some of our societies had not done hitherto, especially in generations gone by. And given that, you know, in those societies, women rarely left the house anyway. And when they did, they would go out in groups to do a group task and then come back. Given that the modern world, you know, that has gone out the window, whether we like it or not, it is a fact. And that our sisters, our daughters, your daughters are going to the university, going everywhere, going shopping when they need to, going to the grocery store. And the one place where we want to maintain our traditional values is the mosque. Clearly, there's an element, you know, of um, cognitive dissonance going on here. There's an element of that just doesn't make any sense. Like the one place we'd rather they go to than anywhere else is the masjid to listen to a halakha, to pray and whatnot. So I am definitely a big advocate of generally speaking. I don't want to speak about specific masajid because again, let each masjid try to, I mean, let those fights happen within. Who am I to get involved within the local district and community? But the sisters who live there from within in a gentle manner, let's see what can be done. Approach the board, see what can be done. But from my side, generically, I will state that I think it is necessary to protect the iman of our brothers and sisters and especially our sisters that we accommodate them as much as the Sharia allows them to be accommodated. And we should rethink through gender roles, not genders, gender roles, so that we can prevent a greater onslaught, a more, uh, an unwelcome onslaught, right? We need to bend a little so that we can preserve a lot. And we have to be blunt and clear about this. That's why I'm being so blunt and clear. We don't mince our words. I actually say this very explicitly when I teach sisters uh, uh, classes and whatnot. I say, listen, I'm more than happy to fine tune the default, but I'm not going to change the fact that there is and there was a default. You should know there is and there was a default. The fact that we're fine tuning it for our times, it's because times have changed. But let's not criticize the past. And let's not claim our modern notions are the default. Let us understand what we're doing here. And let us recognize that, yes, there might be a maslah for our time and place, but th th it doesn't mean that the people in the past had it you know, wrong for all of these 13 and a half you know, centuries. So bottom line, uh, women's only masjids don't make any sense to me whatsoever. Why? Um, if your masjid doesn't have... Now, by the way, this is not an American phenomenon in terms of women... Don't come to the masjid. It's very rare in America to have such a masjid. Very rare. There are still some, but frankly, I don't even know of any. I don't know of any mainstream masjid like this, right? Um, but if there is such a masjid, work from within, or for sure you will find a masjid close by that has a woman's space. 
Now, I think we should very practically and pragmatically make a condition that women's prayer spaces need to have a similar ambience. Don't throw them in the closet. Don't throw them in the moldy carpet. You know, have adequate um, AV facilities, you know, that they can hear the sheikh, you know, see what not. All of this is, I think, a part and parcel of what we can reasonably uh, demand. Um, other than this, I mean, uh, the fact that there are, are, are there any women's only messages in the UK? I don't think so, right? Not that I know of. Not that yeah. I know of. Okay, even the one here, it, it's more of a PR thing than an actual lived reality. You know this. I mean, it's not as if they actually have regular you know, events and what is more of a PR an orthodox place? Uh, yes, sir. What is it? What orthodox place? Um, no, right, progressive, and it's uh, the standard progressive place. Um, and yeah, I mean, 30 40 people go there in all of North America, so be it. You're gonna have these, you know, fringe ideas and opinions, and some of their grievances are legit, but the solution to those grievances is not to break away, the solution is not to form your own, the solution is to work from within. and you know, the sad reality is that at least within the North American scene, by and large, our sisters are accommodated. Our families are accommodated, by and large. I know there's many exceptions. The main complaint that our sisters have, which is a legit complaint, is that the ambiance is subpar. That's a legit complaint. But by and large, almost every masjid that is built here has place for the sisters to pray. Allahumma, except for those temporary musallas for Jumu'ah, you know, they hire an office or they hire something. That's not a, 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 a full built masjid. That's like, you know, it has to be done, you know, for the for the time being. I'm not talking about those temporary musallayat, which yes, generally speaking, are male dominated because it's Jumu'ah. They only hire them for Jumu'ah. And if five females show up, they'll be right at the back and they might feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, it is what it is. That's not a purpose built. In terms of purpose built, in terms of appropriated spaces, America, North America, Canada, by and large, it is men and women, both of them. Yeah, I don't think that there's, um, I mean, I have to say that actually I found that a very kind of uh, cautious and careful um, when what you said, I, I, I would go further. I would say that the, the changing roles, the ones that have caused so much uh, disturbance amongst male minds, right, that have led to this kind of counter- uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, Andrew Red Tate. Hill culture. The yeah, all, but, yeah all that's Rose. What is it? <laughs> whatever the yeah. boss is, I'm, I'm just behind on all of this kind of lingo, but that type of uh, thing. Um, it, of course, there have been changes which have led to reactions, obviously, that being a crazy reaction, but uh, surely I actually think that the priority now when it comes to prayer space is to be focused on the ladies as opposed to men. I think that with men being able to always have an option to pray outside easy, security-wise, the like, and women less so, less so, less so, even though, by the way, they are extremely industrious. That's one thing that I found out through this class, right? Recording Divine Link, when we went out into, like, you know, doing the live demos and stuff with different sisters, like, the way that they were able to say, right, listen, this is the shops that we go to, this is the shops that we don't go to, this is what you look for in a dressing room, Right. So, you know, the like, so for example, they've these girls are next level, man. They've worked out the kind of dressing rooms you pray in and those that you don't. Those that they judge them by the, the length of the doors. Bro, there's a, there's a whole lot of fuck out there that we've never even heard of. <laughs> so, the, so the doors apparently, uh, I mean, the standard question about music's playing. We cover that, and that's straightforward. You're not you're not uh, uh, listening to the music. You're hearing. Sama versus istima. Yeah. Exactly. There's a difference between that. But the doors and uh, the the fact that you should not have a gap at the bottom so much so that you, uh, people will be looking under when you're in sajda. One the, one of the sisters was saying that when you come across, if you if you, you don't, if you don't have a choice, you go for that one. But you always put the your bags across. Yeah, mashallah. They know what they're doing. They're gonna they're, they're gonna they're going to uh, adapt, but do they? Uh, should they be adapting? All right? Should they be forced to do that but with men having the responsibility to protect, to look after, and support? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and and of course, let's not forget. Let's be again the awkward issue of a woman bowing and prostrating in public. Why should she have to do that? A man, it's a hundred times, a million times easier, right? Why should our sisters have to do that? So again, like I said, clearly we should be advocating for. Uh, female spaces in, in our messages. You know, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I hope, inshallah, um, the communities that don't have that, uh, they should rethink through. And even if it means that, 
you know, um, uh, they give them certain timings to come or whatever it might be. I mean, I, I don't know the logistics of this particular masjid, but something should be done such that our sisters allowed, are allowed to pray. I know it, it, there was a major issue, wasn't it, that a sister wanted to pray and she the time was going out and that masjid didn't even allow her to pray. I don't yeah. understand. I mean, that, that's not very healthy. And so, yeah, it's we, not healthy. It's not healthy. The problem is, it's the individual uh, kind of cases that cause the news. If you look into it, the history of that much is fascinating when it was set mm -hmm. up in the 60s. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, they, they can watch that on the video. That's that, that, that will come out tomorrow. It's from the, a clip from the class. All right. I know that uh, Sheikh said you have a TISA class coming up right now. Um, and uh, time's limited. One more from you. Um, uh, to basically uh, close up and then I'll just uh, uh, address these folks. I know that you need to go. I'm not going to keep you any more than what we agreed. Um, what's your final kind of uh, thing that's been on your heart or mind that you want, want to have, want to re recreate some beef over? Let's, let's finish in a, in a healthy way. <laughs> About the fiqh of salah. Um, I don't know. What was your, what was your position on the, the COVID? Uh, I think we're on a similar wavelength, right? During the COVID crisis, that was the last big crisis of like, when it was at its peak that was yeah there was there was little there was little to be worried about there the big issue was when a jama'ah is a jama'ah from yeah. not being not being in the main hall so following on tv and yeah. then by extension of following then on in buildings um i can't remember where you ended up because you're all over the place these days so tell yeah me no what... no i i my my opinions throughout all of covid were consistent i didn't change my mind throughout all of the years and, and oh fifth council gave the same fatwa so we were i mean we were all you know working on this together because obviously we got we got we got we got taken by surprise because they do went and you know gave the yeah. fatwa but yeah and, and that, then that... backtrack as well <laughs> yeah exactly and he can't deny it. he he <laughs> gave it let's be fair he's my teacher man he's yeah. my guy yeah but yeah. but but he gave the fatwa and then obviously yeah. realized it was a mistake but um yeah. but yeah you didn't go down that line yeah no 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 no. but i said for um salat al jumu'ah and eid that year we, we couldn't have eid i said like a, a suri yani, uh, you know a, a fake joining where you just sit there because that's what we did at epic you know we had live stream to thousands of people and I just said to them, sit down with your family in your houses, listen to the khutbah as if it's a khutbah. And when it, I stand up for to pray my two rak'ah, you pray your four rak'ah dhuhr. <laughs> okay, it's like, you just do that, okay. And the same for Salat al-Eid, that year we didn't have Eid, we said the same thing, that, you know, you just yani, listen to the khutbah. And if you want to stand and give two, three minutes, and then, yani, you know, the, the salah, I mean, first salah, and then that, you know what I'm saying? The same thing, like, you know, so, no, sorry, it was the other one. So you, you pray your salah, Right, we're gonna announce. We're pray. We're praying now, guys. You guys pray. That's what we literally did. We announced. You know, it was me and you know three people behind me, six feet apart. So people are, and we're gonna. You guys pray. We're gonna pray now. And I think that was the mainstream fatwa. And this is fiqh nawazil. This is where ijtihad comes in, right? And then obviously, when for that five six months we had the six feet distance. Once again, we had issues where people said is jama'ah is batil and whatnot. We said no, yani six feet for a reason and you are visual you're all seeing each other it's clearly the point is when you look at such a group of people all praying in unison you understand it is a jama'ah istilahan and aqlan you understand it's a jama'ah even if our classical fuqaha didn't have this type of nas this is where modern ijtihad comes so we said no problem for those five six months where you know between the band being lifted and you know joint you had to have the six feet apart yeah and for that time we had three different jumuahs and each one was that six feet apart and yeah, alhamdulillah, that's the, and I think that was the majority of fatwa as well around the globe. And I think it's important to clarify as well that that when you said that for a person to, you know, to, to, to listen to the khutbah, this is only because they're not coming to the masjid or... Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah, it's not, it's not ibadah, it's just like nafila. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So it's, yes. a, it's a visual thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, so let me put a real uh, uh, case to you. I mean, that was temporary. Let's do the real stuff. Obviously, the issue that, that this comes from is praying in hotels uh, in Mecca. Right and in the musallas and, and looking down and not leaving, you know, the musalla because it takes ages to get down, or it's you know hot and crowded, and you're with the great unwashed masses, and people don't want to do that. So you see all the Americans, mashallah, yeah, praying in the musalla. All your boys from Epic, uh, tell us, yani, how are you? Just... That was a low roll, right? I just came right at the end. <laughs> Stop for Allah. Did you meet our group? I have a, we have a group there right now, by the way. Yeah, they were in the musalla, bro. So I didn't see them. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I'll make sure that uh, they are updated about AE's diss against them. MashaAllah. We were in the cabin frame, bro, down the bomb. Yeah. 
of you Americans up there in the Fairmont Hotel? No. So, so the question but Here's is, a question back to you. To get to the Kaaba, when did you have to leave to pray inside the Haram? At the moment, you've got to be half an hour before the Adhan. Okay, Khalas, you've oh, answered wait, wait. your question. Yeah. You've answered the question right there. What do you so, do so, with most of the children, the women, the elderly, who are not going to be able to make it half an hour before every single salah? Why are people even going for Umrah then if they don't? If they think that this is... Are they going on a holiday? This is the problem, right? This is yeah. the... They're going on a luxury holiday where they want a luxury experience. What should they just mm -hmm. go to Dubai? Mm -hmm. why, why, why are they changing any of the structure of the deen? Allah, from what I hear, they might be making a muqa'ab there. But anyway, astaghfirullah, that's yani. You know that you love that behavior. <laughs> I know, man. Right. So, so so, here's the thing. So here's the thing which really... Now, I'm super strict against that. And I don't want to hear none of that nonsense. And it really irritates me. But I will say this much. In this program that I've just finished right now, that I've just come back from, I spent half of the time praying in the extension. Hmm. And the extension has grown on me on a way that I never imagined because I was using it last year and it was very dirty. They had not been cleaning it because the staff were not there. Hmm. Now everybody's back and the cleaning and everything is back to full levels. The extension is unbelievable. And I don't know whether you noticed, but where the people are sitting and the way that they've designed it, for all of the men and women, you can see a glimpse of the Kaaba, just a glimpse, every angle. MashaAllah, that's good. It's, it's the most extraordinary design, actually. But you know, even for the extension, you needed half an hour to get there? No, no. For the extension, you can actually get, uh, uh, you can leave at uh, Adhan or 10 minutes before Iqamah. That's yeah, more reasonable, yeah. So again, yani, no, no, I no, the, thing is, though, no, no, the point I was going to make is that if, if someone is going to say that it is completely impermissible to be praying in a musallah with the jama'ah or further back, you know the extension. When you're praying in there, you're probably at some points half a kilometer away from the line in front of you. Yeah. And it's, that's, not, it's not as straightforward as people think, Yanni. That's, yeah, that's my and point. That's the point. So if you're already that way and there's Mutasil Sufuf all the way to the Fairmont and you're praying on the second floor, M floor, whatever it might be, Yanni, I understand the position. I don't see a problem with it when the crowd is such that it is clearly. Yani, you can clearly see the sufuf going to a reasonable distance. It doesn't have to go straight so to the me, wall. Let me, let me play advocate against that. If you wait until the very last second before the iqama, then of course your lines are going to then develop like that. The problem here is the attitude. The problem Agreed. here is a sense of privilege. Agreed. But and to, that's say, that the salah, to yeah. say that the sufuf are not mutasir and the salah is baltid is also too harsh. You can say the attitude is lazy. 100% agree. You can the say reason that we you're... can't. The reason we can't say that the salah is batil is because the Maliki and the Hanafiya, except just seeing the the, the line from the top, you know, for it to be a tisan sufu. So yeah, yeah, and you, yeah, and again, to folks who are watching the class, the, these kind of madhabs and positions, of course, are going to be will be covered uh, in detail. Uh, but uh, Sheikh Yasser, listen, I appreciate um, your time. I know that you you need to go for the next class, yes, so uh, you go and um, I'll. Uh, I'll finish off here. I don't want to hold you anymore. We had an agreement. Inshallah, look forward to seeing you soon, inshallah, whenever that next time will be. And to all the yeah. students online, Zakumullah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and your talab al-ilm. May Allah give you barak and your time. May Allah azawaja protect my and your uh, families from any harm, from any evil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide others through us. Zakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So folks, uh, I appreciate you guys uh, uh, coming for the uh, for the webinar. That was Sheikh Yasser sharing his uh, thoughts. Always someone that has uh, um, uh, looked at the different issues that, that affect the Muslims um, and uh, always willing to research them deeply. That's one of the things that he doesn't get credit for. A lot of people will react to his statements, which are kind of like, you know, one line uh, social media kind of very, uh, what's the word? I don't know. They're, they're good clickbait. That's the word. Clickbait type kind of uh, positions that he has and they don't appreciate actually just the depth that goes into those statements. They're not throwaway statements. Um, now, folks, with respect to this, obviously, we've come to the natural time for this class anyway, but I know that he had to start his class, so I had to let him go. Um, the Fiqh Salah, as a class, folks, has been covering um, what we've covered today in today's lesson, in today's session, yeah, um, in far more detail, of course, and then all of the normative aspects of Fiqh. All of the things that you come across in your your day, whether you're at home or traveling or at work, or whether you're in a car or travel in uh, in particular modes of transport, 
in situations of emergency, in sickness and in health, every single possible situation that you can be, whether you're alone, whether you're in the congregation, whether you're in the office with non-Muslims, whether with Muslims, whether in the masjid, whether in uh, gatherings, uh, mixed gatherings, female only, male, every single thing that a whole team of people sat down and we, you know, we, we just brainstormed every issue. And obviously I've been teaching the Fiqh Salah for, for donkey's years, right? Fiqh Salah um, has been one of Al-Maghrib's most popular classes on site. So I took all of that experience, all of the questions that I've been asked, and then I put it and I added as much as I possibly could, knowing that we had the opportunity to be able to use technology and all the different kind of, you know, camera crews and things like that. So um, I think pretty much everybody here on this uh, on this uh, webinar has signed up to the class and they and they know what's going on. I'll be very brutally honest. You folks were not the ones that I was targeting when I made this class. All right. Straight up. Um, the honest, honest truth. We need to reach out to the masses. We're not the masses. You know, we're, we're the, you know, we're, and I don't like preaching to the converted. Right. We're not the masses. Uh, you folks will get your questions answered. It's not difficult to get questions answered at the mosques and not imams and whatever. We want to get to the people who don't go to the mosques and don't have an imam. Don't, um, uh, you know, th 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 I mean, I'm not, I'm not belittling you folks who are signing to the class and studying it. Of course, you know that you need to do that anyway. You know, it's obligatory. I shouldn't be selling this to you. It's obligatory knowledge that you need to chase. It's a no-brainer. But there are lots of people that, you know, in their heart, they want to pray. And they might be embarrassed about it. They might not have the, you know, make excuses all the time. I can't come to that class. I can't come to it. This class can be gifted. I told those guys, listen, make a system where you can actually send it to someone, right? And it's there on their computer, on their phone, and on their TV, and on their casting devices forever. And they've got resource for it forever. And I can access it all the time. And there are these live sessions, as I said, that um, uh, that I conduct. And after you've watched a few of the modules and you've got in your mind some of the questions that we've been seeing today, for example, and then you're able to put them to me in, in live in real time and we respond and we hold that regularly each time that you cover through the, the modules too let alone the fact that there are so many uh, most of these questions are answered anyway so a quick uh, uh request please think of those friends and family that you know that need this okay and they wouldn't come to the live class they wouldn't come to the class in the university they wouldn't come to the event that's happening next weekend you you know exactly what i'm talking about well you can now gift this to them uh they have access to the whole thing um there's such a large group of of of, of muslims that we need to bring closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just by showing them the then bam 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 we've got to pray and why you're not praying but uh, but put the whole thing to them in the beautiful way that we all know right so there needs to be a combination. This is what I was thinking about. It's got to be the fiqh with the with the banter, with the the beauty of the is with this uh, of the salah, with the spirituality, with all the modern issues, with being relatable, speaking in a language and a vernacular uh, that people can relate to. And um, I think that's what the fiqh of salah is. Um, you would have seen some of the videos that have been released thus far. Little clips. There was loads more, but. Um, uh, there's not that much more time now because there's other things that need to be done before Ramadan kicks in, before Al Maghrib uh, changes its focus to Ramadan programming and, and the services that it's providing. And so I would I would encourage you uh, highly to jump in. None of your questions will be ignored. I know that today some people might have thought that um, that this was a and a session. This was never meant to be a and a session. The Q and A sessions in the class, though they are nothing but Q and A sessions. So even the live sessions will answer everything. And and people who may be thinking that I've taken the on the site version, this is possibly twice the content of the on site version. Let alone five times the demonstrations. Let alone the time and the the space to be able to explain and and demonstrate that which we were not able to do um, uh, on 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 the class. All you have to do, anyone who has that question, is just go to the Al YouTube channel or the Instagram, whatever it is. And just look at the videos and you'll see these videos and you'll say, God, I took this class when it came to London first time around, when it came to London second time around, when it was in Toronto, when it was in Singapore, when it was in Kuala Lumpur. And clearly this is not what we did. This is a whole different uh, game. So 
Um, I think that's enough for me. Barakallahu um, feekum. And uh, again, I just want to make it absolutely clear. The links on, on the on the uh, on the webcast thing or wherever you're watching this, um, and in virtually every question that I've seen, virtually every single question that I have seen has been answered and in detail as well in the class. Nothing has been avoided. All right, guys. Barakallahu feekum. Zakumullah khair for. Um, for joining and the first Q&A session, by the way, the first live Q&A session is this Thursday. This Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UK time, of course, all recorded. This webinar is indeed recorded, so you'll be able to catch up with the beginning part of it, okay? Because I know that the night time might have got a bit you know, mixed up. Uh, and of course, the classes are there. The Q&A sessions will be recorded as well, even the live ones. And that's why it's important to be on the portal now, because then you can put the questions forward in advance, and then I answer it in the live session, even if you can't make it. And then when you watch the recording, your question's been answered. What more do you want? Guys, living the life, man. Honestly, the life of Riley. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullahu khaira. Closing in three days. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa antu astaghfiruka Allahumma wa atubu ilaykum. Wassalamu alaykum.